I'm back in plenary session, virtual edition. I'm joined by Katie Scharf. Dr. Scharf is an infectious disease expert. She's an ID doctor at uh, Kaiser Permanente Northwest in Portland, Oregon. She's the chief of ID. She's also the author of two really interesting papers that we're gonna walk through and talk about some of the complexity with methodology. I just wanna read the title and then the conclusion, and then I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Scharf. The title of the papers, so people get a sense of what we're gonna talk about. Risk of myopericarditis following COVID-19 mRNA vaccination in a large integrated health system, a comparison of completeness and timeliness of two methods. And the next one, surveillance of myopericarditis following COVID-19 booster dose vaccination in a large integrated health system. And I will just read the conclusion, which I think will point us what we're gonna talk about. We identified additional valid cases of myopericarditis following an mRNA vaccination that would be missed by the VSD search algorithm, which depends on select hospital discharge diagnosis codes. The true incidence of myopericarditis is markedly higher than the incidence reported to advisory committees. The VSD should validate its search algorithm. And then the other one concludes, we identified a rate of 9.1 cases of myopericarditis per 100,000 COVID-19 booster doses, which is higher than prior estimates reported by VAERS. Dr. Scharf, thanks so much for doing this. Pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for having me. Nice to see you. It's nice to see you. And we, I guess we should disclose we're both graduates of University of Chicago Medical School, Pritzker School of Medicine, a great place. I enjoyed my time there. That's right. Although I didn't know you in medical school. We so. didn't. Well, I, I knew of you, but I don't right. think we had uh, yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. I didn't have too much time to chat. <laughs> so where shall we begin? I, I think the best place to begin is, you know, maybe to talk about the work you were doing and what led you to sort of go down this, go down this rabbit hole and start to look into this issue. Sure, yeah, that's a great place to start off. So um, I'm a clinical infectious disease doc and um, also do um, some administrative work with vaccine implementation. So have been um, intimately involved with vaccine implementation here in Oregon, um, helping set up the All for Oregon vaccine site and then um, co-chairing a committee on vaccine safety. And so, you know, essentially I never was really intending to publish any sort of studies. Um, and um, this work kind of came to be because in my role as co-chair of vaccine safety, in about, I think it was June of 2021, we started to hear about cases of myocarditis after um, COVID vaccine in, in young boys. And um, we just weren't hearing about it in the Northwest. And so um, essentially, because we weren't hearing about it, we were like, why are we not hearing about this? We need to make sure that we're detecting these and submitting them to VAERS. And so um, myself with one of my pharmacy partners, who's a co-author on the paper, turned to our analyst, um, who's also a co-author, and said, hey, can you just set up a um, data collection system uh, you know, to send us cases of myocarditis after vaccine so we can make sure that those cases are submitted to VAERS? So that's... Mm really how this all started is more of like a QA project. Um, and so essentially we would get lists of patients who had a diagnosis code of myopericarditis after receiving their COVID vaccine, and like quickly look through the cases. And if they seem like they fit, I would kind of send an email to the clinician being like, hey, did you submit this to VAERS? Like this needs to be reported. So that, that was really how it started is like, a QA, like we just need to make sure um, that these incidences are being reported under emergency use authorization for these vaccines. So that's kind of where it started. That's really important. And I think, um, I guess it's important in many respects. One, which is that, of course, uh, as an ID doctor, you are undoubtedly a great proponent of vaccination and the miracle of vaccination for many diseases. At the same time, we always want to vaccinate as safely as possible. So it's really important to document the numerator and the denominator. And I guess the other thing that I'm curious about is sometimes you called a physician and they hadn't reported to VAERS. Is that fair to say? Yeah. I mean, as a clinical doc, you know how many charts you have to do, notes you have to do. And so like yeah. one more form to fill out, like I think all of us have best intentions, but sometimes, you know, you forget to fill out the form or you can't find the website or you didn't realize that you were supposed to submit it to VAERS. And so really just encouraging all of those clinicians, like if this was a case to make sure that it got submitted. Um, so really just a QA project. And really I did, that was the summer, like every week we'd get lists through QA, we'd look through them and, you know, identify which ones needed to be submitted and, and really kind of encourage the clinicians to submit them. Um, 
and that's how it all started. Mm -hmm. um, and then, it, you know, it was like fall of 2021. And, you know, we were seeing like a couple cases a week in, in these um, adolescents. And it was, I mean, they were classic. Like you knew right away if it was going to be a case, like classic presentation, you know. Something like they had gotten dose two, three days later, they wake up in the middle of the night with crushing substernal chest pain and come in and they have no other cardiac history and otherwise healthy. Right. And they come in and their troponin bumps to five. And, you know, in the beginning, it was interesting. You'd review the charts and they'd get like a cardiac cath, like a 20 year old got cath. Right. And then like later, as people became more aware, um, you know, they realized like this is just, you know, something that occurs very rarely after vaccine, but does occur. And so it was, a, you know, if there was a case that was vaccine associated myopericarditis, it, it really had a classic presentation. Mm -hmm. So we were seeing you know, a, a couple of these probably every week, because that's when most of the, you know, younger population was getting vaccinated. And so it, was, it wasn't really till the fall that I started to kind of like pay attention to the numbers that we were seeing and the numbers that were being reported in the literature and kind of thinking, gosh, the numbers in the literature are, are quite small. And the numbers we were seeing were quite small too. I mean, like both very rare, but it, it felt like gosh, we're seeing more than what's being reported in the literature. So like, why is that? Um, and that's really when um, there was kind of more of an initiative to move this from a QA project to like, let's figure out, you know, what is this discrepancy? Why do I feel like we're seeing more cases than what's being reported? Um, so that, that's kind of how the research aspect of it started. And that's really interesting. So I guess, um, like so many good clinical questions, it started with um, sort of uh, a, a clinical observation and trying to uh, explain two different sets of uh, incidents uh, data. And if I recall, in the fall of 2021, CDC's estimates were roughly in the one in 40,000 ballpark. Um, estimates from some other countries like Norway and some other investigators were a little bit more frequent, one in the 7,000 to 10,000 ballpark. And then Israel, of course, came out early with a signal in the one in three to 7,000 ballpark. But just to give listeners some perspective as to what we were talking about at the time. But even though this is very rare, and even though vaccination is tremendous good, the difference between those numbers does matter, I think, for thinking about questions about dose and timing and ages and, you know, and how to have the optimal vaccination strategy. And so it actually is important that we clarify exactly where on that spectrum this number falls. Right. And so, you know, really at, at that point, it wasn't like we had a particular number. We just had a, a group of cases. And so really what we did is we took our data, which turned out to be, I mean, we did it per million doses. So, you know, okay. Yes. Um, there's so many yeah. different ways to represent the data. And when you try and like represent it and you look at all the papers, everyone represents it like a little bit differently. Like some are age 12 to 17 and some are age 15 and 16. Yes. And so like trying to pick the age group that stratifies with all of the other papers, is actually kind of challenging because nobody stratifies the data the same. So anyway, you know, the, um, the case, the risk that we found uh, was 95 cases per million doses, which is mm -hmm. you know 9.5 per 100,000 um, in all comers age 12 to 39. Um, and then in men age 12 to 39, we found um, 195 cases per million. So 19.5 uh, cases per 100,000. Mm -hmm. um, and you know we had about 165,000 patients that got a dose of an mRNA vaccine that were in that 12 to 39 year old um, age group. So that was our denominator. It, was, it wasn't like we took a sample. It was everybody who got vaccinated within our um, uh, data set. And then and can you comment about um, when people are Kaiser Permanente members, they are getting more likely than not vaccinated in your data set. They're not getting vaccinated at Walgreens and not getting it in your data set. Is that fair to say? Um, so they could have received their vaccine at an outside location, okay. but because we... Um, so we have our own internal data, but we're also able to see vaccinations through the Oregon and Washington uh, State Registry. Right. So all of that, it's amazing. It's amazing what the that's electronic right. health record could do. Yes. It all okay. talks to each other and it all brings it in. Um, and so we can, you know, if you got vaccinated at Walgreens or Rite Aid, we can see that. Okay, got it. So, okay, that's important to know. Yeah, go on. So, so essentially we found like, this is our number. And then we're like, why is our number seem so different than, you know, what's being reported um, you know, particularly with the vaccine safety data link literature. And so just to explain, um, 
So I think this is complicated and I didn't understand this until I started looking at this. So vaccine safety data link um, has nine sites throughout the country and they use large integrated health systems to inform um, their data. And, and really what they're looking for is um, vaccine safety signals. So they have 23 pre-specified signals that they look for uh, vaccine safety. Hmm. And so our integrated health system in the Northwest region makes up about 7% of the VSD data. Mm -hmm. There are eight other VSD sites that make up, you know, the other 93% of the VSD data. So really we are representing 7% of the VSD data. Um, so whatever we find within our own uh, Northwest Perm data set, it's the same data that, that the VSD finds, finds for this Northwest. Mm -hmm. Chair, it's all the same data. Does that make sense? Yes, and I think like the way I would interpret that is what you're saying is that um, you are one of the VSD sites contributing seven percent, and if you find that there's a difference by two different methods, that's very likely true not just at your place but at all the other ninety three percent of places. Correct, but and I'll get into the complexities of this. It it really depends. So like we in the Northwest have two hospitals we own, but we also have patients that are seen at other community hospitals. And so that can impact how you look at the data. Okay. If you are a VSD site that owns all of your hospitals, you don't, and I'll, I'll get into this, this yeah. is like nuance, but okay. that, that could impact the data. So okay. it's so complex and I've learned so much about data and claims and diagnosis codes. It's amazing, but yes. Um, yes, but is essentially my answer to your question. Okay, that's a great point. Okay, now then explain one thing for the listeners so that they clarify. The difference between VSD and VARES, which is they hear VARES a lot more. So what is VARES and how is that different? Okay. And again, I am not the expert. I am not the expert on this. So I, just, okay. I am a clinical infectious disease. <laughs> um, but VARES is essentially a vaccine adverse event reporting system. So VARES is a reporting system where anyone can report in a suspected um adverse event related to vaccine. And under the emergency use authorization for vaccines, um, as a health system, we're required to report certain events like serious adverse events, but you are also required to report, you know, dosing errors, like any sort of error, but anyone can report. Like I can report, you can report, my mom can report, like any, you don't have to be clinical to report. And so that's, you know, it depends on people reporting. And then they go through and review all those cases and essentially adjudicate, is it real or is it not? VSD yes. is um, vaccine safety data link. And so that is a surveillance method um, also run by the CDC looking for safety signals related to vaccines. So they have 23 pre-specified conditions. And this isn't just for COVID vaccines. This is for all vaccines right. is my understanding. Um, and they're really just looking for safety signals. But I think that that's an important point that I have learned through this process is that VSD is looking for safety signals, but they are not designed to provide a precise case ascertainment um, of you know, how many incidences of myocarditis are happening after vaccine. They're really just looking for a signal and that, that's what it was designed for. Is that uh, your question? Yeah, and I think that's well put and I guess I guess the strengths of the approaches and the weaknesses, the strengths of the approaches of VAERS is, um, you know, presumably you could be getting lots of reports from any single person in America. And so you really have a huge catchment area and you could have a lot of power real quick to find a signal. The downside is that, you know, all these systems are subject to the two errors. One is there could be a real safety signal you're not catching, of course. And the other thing is you could be catching something that's not related to the vaccine, it's just coincidental. And so I think all these data require careful one, like making sure it's the same thing you're, you're tallying up and not different clinical entities. And two, comparing it against some baseline rate or what you would expect in the absence of vaccination. Um, and, and then the third point to your point is, is that the key for these systems, my understanding, is that the people who are giving out vaccines, they obviously want to act quickly if they find something that they didn't expect. They don't wanna wait a long time. And so these are systems to generate a signal um, that later you can refine a precise estimate of how often it occurs, but at least you were tipped off to it earlier so you can be aware to know what to look for and, um, and, and potentially, not in this case, but if it was something truly unprecedented, such as VIT, vaccine-induced thrombosis and thrombocytopenia with J&J, &J, it can lead to real regulatory changes in a quick moment. Uh, many European nations limited that product in women, for instance. 
Yeah, and I guess I would say like the the great strength of the VSD is it is are is just constantly detecting for these signals. So uh, yes, even um, passive, even without somebody, right? Yeah, you don't need people reporting. Like it is looking at the data um, for these signals, and so it's a great, um, I guess, passive surveillance system to look at these signals. I so, see, and um, together they're complementary. They're complementary. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we have a lot of safety signals in place for vaccine safety. And I think that that is fantastic. And I, I really, you know, um, applaud, you know, the systems that we have in place. Um, and, and so I guess our study is just looking at like, how can we improve upon the systems that are already there? And that's really the question we ask. Like these systems are already in place to pick up these safety signals, but how can we provide a precise estimate of the risk of myopericarditis after COVID vaccine. Like, what do we need to do? And, and that's really, you know, where we looked at, you know, our study versus the, the VSD. So we replicated the VSD data to see like what was explaining the discrepancy. And so I'm happy to go through that. Yeah, let's complex. start with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's start with how I guess the first thing you do is you recapitulate the VSD finding. Right. So we recapitulated the VSD finding. Um, and and just just so you understand, so the VSD relies on ICD-10 claims data. So that's how. So like, you get hospitalized, you have myopericarditis. You know, eventually the hospital submits a claim. It goes through the claim system, and then they look at that claim, um, and and that's how they pick up the claims data. And so so that's what they rely on ICD-10 claims data. Um, and so we essentially replicated what they found. And um, within the same group of patients, their methodology picked up 11 patients that had myopericarditis um, of our denominator of you know, 165,000 that got vaccinated. And this all, you know, we looked at the, the strict VSD definition. We adjudicated all of these cases. Um, and, and when I say adjudicate, I guess to to clarify what that means. So essentially myself and one other physician went through all of these cases because um, there's a lot of noise. And so you might have a case that says myopericarditis within 21 days of COVID vaccine, but that doesn't actually mean the vaccine was a causal, was a causal re reason for their myocarditis. Like, you know, somebody has congenital heart disease yes. and has a history of myocarditis, or, you know, we had somebody high on drugs and had, you know, some heart issues from their drug overdose. You know, so there's a lot of things going on there. There's a lot of noise. So anyway, VSD replicated it, found 11 patients. Um, but within those 11, you know, there were four that when you, so when you look at it, um, there were some significant delays in the claims data. And so we had four patients that had, you know, a claims delay of over 30 days. I think one patient was like 195 days. And the median for all of those claims data was was 33 days. So I'll pause there and see if you have questions. No, that's very interesting. And I think the points I'm taking away are, these are ICD-10 codes, which are billing codes. They may be added to cases for all sorts of reasons. For instance, if somebody got vaccinated and then got very high on drugs and they had troponin elevation, they might be coded as one of these things. But of course, it might be the drugs doing the damage to the heart and not the vaccine. So you have to exclude that. That requires you to look through by hand. Um, and uh, and, and I think the other terrific point you're making is that uh, a lot of it, a lot of it is just not related to the vaccine and you're removing that by hand. So if somebody were to do an analysis just to use these codes without sort of this kind of a, a, a doctor, thoughtful doctor looking through, they can have a totally off estimate. They could be adding all sorts of things that don't really fit the bill. And, um, and then I think the other point you're making is you focused on 12 to 39 in your paper. Um, because we knew that the risk was higher in that group. And also uh, it's more relevant because uh, obviously the older you are, the benefits of vaccination are so colossal uh, that, you know, it's really almost a moot. I mean, it's always important to think about safety, but if you're 80 years old, you, you should be getting the vaccine yesterday. I mean, there's no reason to be delayed. Um, so I think it's very important what you did. And I, I think that is good. Um, you want to go, go to the next part, which is your, so you're basically doing what they're doing. Um, so that was like yeah. the first part is replicating yeah. it. And then essentially with our study, so we use encounter diagnosis codes. So mm -hmm. we're not relying on ICD-10 claims data. We're looking at encounter diagnosis codes. We had 32 encounter diagnosis codes, which essentially mapped to 21 ICD-10 codes. 
And so we found 16 patients and we're like, okay, why are we finding oh, the day, yeah. more than, than the VSD? And so there was three big reasons why we found more. Okay. Um, the first reason was just an ICD-10 code was missed. So um, I-514, myocarditis, myocarditis unspecified. My favorite one, my favorite code. Was just not, <laughs> was just not included. Uh, and I-319 was also not included. That didn't actually account for any cases. Um, you know, I mean, like I'm so happy that we found those codes because the VSD has now updated their criteria to include those two codes. So if Good. you look at the ACIP meeting notes from you know January and February, they now include those two codes. So more inclusive, you know, we're already improving vaccine safety by adding those two codes. So that was reason number one. Reason number two that you know we found more cases was claims delay. So essentially we're looking at data up through October of 2021. Um, because that's when they're starting to have discussions about like, should young kids get vaccines and boosters, et cetera, this is October of 2021. And so essentially we're getting with this encounter diagnosis code, we're getting all the data in real time. We're not relying on claims. The VSD um, data, because it's claims, there, there's claims delay. So as I said, median duration, 33 days. Some, some cases weren't, you know, reported till like day 195. So, and I think this is important because people may not appreciate that um, the people filing the claims are filing the claims to get money. And there's a new, and I don't know the exact numerical cutoff. It, it might even be three months or six months. It's, it's, it's further out than these numbers are given, but there's a numeric, there's like a cutoff by which they have to submit their claims data, but they're not necessarily in a rush to do it. Like a private hospital, for instance, they may um, you know, it's expensive to hire all these people billing. I mean, they're, they're whole rooms in the hospital full of people doing this kind of billing and submitting and stuff. And, um, and, uh, and so it's natural that some claims are being submitted later, uh, later from the encounter. And that what you're saying is that the, the standard methodology would be missing those because it's, it has cutoffs that are more sooner than those claims are submitted. Um, and your method is different because you are actually, you're, you're, you're searching the text of the EHR. Is that accurate? Searching the diagnosis codes. So the diagnosis like, codes, okay. So like if, and and I guess another difference is we're looking not only at inpatient and ED visits, we're also looking at outpatient visits. Oh, that's right. Okay, okay, right. Um, and so it's a diagnosis code, like you see a patient in the clinic and you put in your diagnosis code of myocarditis as like your billing code for that clinic visit. Okay. Um, and what I would say with the claims delay is that really only applies to patients seen at outside hospitals. So as I said- I see. For, our, wait, for, for Kaiser, but for other places, there might be uh, different claims delays. So, you know, I don't know. I can't speak to that. What I know with our system is like, we have two hospitals for mm -hmm. our network, but then a lot of our patients were a, a regional health um, network. So a lot of our patients are seen at community hospitals. I see. And so if you're, if VSD is relying on those cases, they have to wait for the claims to be submitted from those community hospitals, where if they're seen at a Kaiser hospital, um, they don't need to wait on that. Okay. Claim. Got it. Um, it's, it's amazing how complicated and nuanced yes. this is. Um, now what's the third reason? The third reason. So this was one. So essentially like when the VSD came up with their case definition, they said, we're going to look back. 21 days from time of vaccine. And, you know, when we first wrote our code, we were looking back 30 days, just that, that's how we had written it like way back in June when we were just doing this as like a QA. And so what's interesting about having surveillance out to 30 days is you actually end up picking up more cases. And let me give you an example, because yeah. this is super confusing to people. And um, I think if I give you an example, it makes more sense. So we had like a um, an adolescent male who got admitted, had a troponin bump, had chest pain, and the diagnosis code at the time of his hospitalization was chest pain. So he got discharged with a diagnosis of chest pain. And he, you know, his chest pain was four days after his vaccine. Then on day 22 after his vaccine or 23 after his vaccine, um, he got seen at the pediatric cardiology clinic. Yes, yes. And so the pediatric cardiologist was like, oh no, this wasn't chest pain. This was myopericarditis from the vaccine. So that was outside of that 21, I but see, it was right. like, it might've been day 25. I have to look back at the exact, but it was within 30 days. And so it's really 
when you do the case adjudication, like he got his original diagnosis code was chest pain. But if you actually do some longitudinal follow-up, you find that, you know, once they see the outpatient cardiologist, they get their actual diagnosis of myocarditis at day 25. Right. So and, that, and yes. So we picked up a couple more cases that way. Um, and we did that in the, in this paper, the first paper in the booster paper, we just left it at 21 to keep it clean. Cause that's what all of these systems are doing. But I guess I don't know where the 21, like why 21, why are we only looking today? 21. Um, and it's and, potentially 21 days post dose two. Correct. Right. And so yeah. like they all had their myocarditis within a few days of dose two, but it wasn't like properly coded till day right. 25. Correct. Because and that's I think when they saw the specialist who was like, no, 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 you don't have chest pain, you have myocarditis. So. Yes. And uh, I think the reason it's interesting is that pediatric cardiologists are uh, busy and they also, it's like not easy to get a slot in that pediatric cardiology clinic. And I know because somebody was telling me about like, you know, people who need clearance for athletic activities and stuff. And if you like the consult lists are long um, at a lot of places. And so, um, you know, so it's possible that, yeah, these are coded as something not myocarditis. And then they come and say, oh, come on, look at this picture. It's classic at the diagnosis. Right. right. Okay. So, so that was the other, and that's confusing. Um, and I think our revised version, our response to the reviewer's comments, hopefully clarifies that. So. So you're saying uh, the VSD method would have identified 11 cases. Your additional methods have identified 16. So mm -hmm. you have sort of a 45% increase in the numerator, um, and which translates into the, the different uh, numbers you're quoting per million. Correct. And I guess I would say one additional point is that our method is picking up these 16 in a a timely fashion. Like we're picking them up within days of them occurring. The VSD, you know, they pick them up, but because of that claims delay, if you're not, if they're not billing for 195 days, that one's not going to be picked up. So then when you are making vaccine policy that's time dependent, you might not have ascertained all those cases. So maybe when you make vaccine policy, you say, this is cases that I can be confident in you know, prior to the last 90 days, but there may be some lag in the last 90 days. I um, see. That's an interesting point. Methodology. So, so that I think part of it is like, they might eventually get the cases, but there's a time delay. And as we know, in this current environment, like everything is so fast. So that, that time delay, you know, is a limitation. And, um, you know, you have this lovely figure in the paper, which kind of puts some of these things in perspective. Um, but it's uh, it's basically showing, you know, um, rates per million, ages twelve to seventeen. You're you're in the you know one eighty six to two hundred ballpark. Um, but for men, the second dose, age twelve to seventeen, three seventy seven per million, and um, and uh, for 18 to 24, and it looks like from not just your study, but many studies, the 18, 18 to 24 is like the highest risk demographic. A little bit younger is higher, but a little bit lower. And then over 24 to 30 is lower. Um, but the risk appears to be, you know, higher than baseline, even for 40 year olds, for instance. Um, you didn't go up that high, but even 39 year olds, for instance, higher than baseline risks. And I guess I would say is, you know, our study is, 165,000 patients. Correct. So like the precision of our risk is not as good as it could be. If we replicated this at all of the VSD sites, you know, I said we're 7%, we'd have a much more precise estimate of like truly what is that risk in the 12 to 17 and the 18 to 24. Um, you know, I, I can I can see based on our data what the trend is, but you know, I really you know, would love to have a bigger sample size to get that precision. Right. And that's, um, that, that's a very good point. And is that also why you're not separating Pfizer and Moderna? Yeah, we just didn't have, well, it's interesting. Pfizer was like the hot vaccine, I think. Uh, in initially. Yes. Yeah. Like yeah. everybody wanted Pfizer. Um, yeah. And so most of our cases were Pfizer, Okay, but we also didn't have enough power, you know, not enough big sample size to, to differentiate, uh, just yeah. not enough people. Um, and when we looked back, I think like a very small fraction got Moderna. Yeah, I see. Um, but the reason I, in, I I knew when I read your paper the first time that you were very close to 
you know, the actual number was not just your paper, but it's the convergence of all the data sets. We have data from Ontario province, from Norway, um, you know, other countries which have different systems and collection and, and the Israeli data. I mean, I remember there was an article, I think it was July in Nature, where Israel is being quoted as what the estimate was, um, which is very consistent with your estimates. So it is the more parsimonious idea is that Americans are the same, you know, more or less the same as Canadians, um, that it would be roughly the same. I wonder if you I might. Think Hong Kong yeah. just came out with a study that was very similar. Um, Who did? Hong Kong. There's oh, yes. One. Yes. I, I saw that Hong Kong study. Yeah, that's another example. Right. So, um, yes. You want to talk about, I mean, what are the implications for VSD? I mean, I guess what you're suggesting is this is a way in which VSD could be strengthened for future vaccines. Yeah. I mean, I think it, I guess what I would say is that. VSD is a great system and they do a great job of safety signal. But, you know, the way that VSD is designed currently is not for a precise case ascertainment, not for a precise risk. And I guess, you know, my message or like what I really would love to happen is that all of the other VSD sites replicate this right. to really understand the, you know, the risk of myocarditis. Um, after vaccine. I guess my other, you know, question is, you know, I listened to the ACIP meetings and I listened to the VRPAC meetings and the VSD does a fantastic job of presenting their data, but I guess I don't hear that the policymakers are understanding the limitations of the data that's being presented to them. Like, and maybe they understand it and, and you know, I, I hope that they do. And, you know, I, I give them the benefit of that, that they understand the limitations, but I guess I want them to understand that the that VSD was not created to make a precise case estimate. So when Dr. Oliver, who's fantastic, does her like risk benefit um, modeling and using VSD numbers, like I really want them to understand that there are some limitations to the VSD numbers that they're using. Yes, that's the important point. Um, maybe we'll talk about that now for a second. I guess, you know, I think like some of this discussion gets so derailed by people saying that. The suggestion is either don't vaccinate a child at all or an adolescent or give them three doses. Because there's a lot in between those two things. And I think that's where it gets derailed, which is, you know, and I've looked at this question early on and I looked at a lot of their modeling and I wrote a piece in the summer of 2021 on it where I felt like, you know, imagine that 12 year old boy who got the first dose. Um, that boy has some reduction in the risk of subsequent hospitalization from SARS CoV 2 just by having one dose. We now know, I think, from some New England Journal papers that it might be substantive in the high 80s and even 90%. They'll get a little bit more reduction in severe disease hospitalization from the second dose, but they're already getting a lot from the first dose. Then the question is, how do you balance the additional benefit in terms of a further reduction in hospitalization and severe disease from dose two and the durability of that response against the risk of myocarditis, myocarditis from dose two if administered on a 21 and 28 day schedule and if it was Pfizer or Moderna? And I think that, you know, reasonable, there's still uncertainty. And so no one will be able to say, I know for sure. But reasonable people might point out that, you know, the Moderna proposition for, you know, an eight and 19 year old boy, the second dose, that's kind of a, not a, not a ter terribly attractive proposition. And that's why I think some European nations, you know, in men at least under the age of 40, and some even in both genders under the age of 40, they, they struck down the Moderna product because it looked like Moderna had a higher safety signal. The other thing the Ontario people did was they spaced the dose, they, they thought that it might be prudent to delay dose two. And we had data from the United Kingdom where they essentially did that at a country level strategy and they had pretty good antibody response to second dose. And now Ontario, I think has shown that it's an association, of course, it's not causal, but it, it's very likely that it is causal, that by spreading that second dose out, you can mitigate some of that myopericarditis, which will make a more favorable um, risk benefit assumption. Um, and I think, I want, and I will talk to you more about the implications for boosters in a second, but I wonder is, you know, that, that's why you think it's such an important thing is that we're talking about, you know, um, a scale and on one side of the scale, we're talking about events that occur one in 10 to the power five. And on the other side of the scale, it's one in 10 to the power five or 10 to the power four. And when you're talking in these ballparks, like, you know, little differences do matter. I think they, it, they help you clarify when to give dose two, if should you give dose two and in whom. Yeah, I mean, I think like everything in medicine has risk, like taking Tylenol has risk. I mean, we just know like taking ibuprofen has risk. 
I think the risk of vaccine is extremely low. My kids are both vaccinated. They got two doses. And, you know, looking at the data, I felt that, you know, the risk of myocarditis and other complications, MISC, other complications from COVID, um, or excuse me, the, the, the risk of the complications from COVID far outweighed the risk of myocarditis. So they sure. got vaccinated. But there's nuances and it's complicated. And I guess I just want when these policies are being made that we have the best data available to inform the policies. Absolutely. And that's really, that's really kind of the message of my paper is like, let's improve our detection methodology to have the best data available to improve, to inform the policies that we're making because medicine is complicated and risk benefit is complicated and there's nuances. And um, if we can have better information, like why wouldn't we? Right. And then I think, you know, even for people who steadfastly believe that everyone should get, at least at the time of this work, two doses, and maybe now they steadfastly, everyone should get three, whatever they believe, um, you know, you can use one product over the other product if there's a difference in the products. Um, you know, they both provide excellent protection, Pfizer and Moderna. And mm -hmm. in the beginning, you didn't have a choice. Like when I got mine, um, it was whatever, they, you know, right. so I, I pushed my way. Like December of 2020, yeah. right? right. Like whatever you can get, whatever you can get, and right. I put I push people out of the way to get that. You know, I was, I was a word. You know, but but yeah, but now there's a choice. There's an abundance, um, right. and so you could choose, and then you can also delay. But let's talk about the the booster data because I think you're one of the very first people to even come up with a number for this question, mm -hmm. um, and we still don't have robust numbers. So let's right. talk about that. I mean, so this is a brief report, and um, it's you know currently published, so um, you can find it. Um, out there on PubMed, but congratulations! Uh, thanks. It was like, as one of my colleagues said, that's the fastest from submission to publication I've ever seen. <laughs> um, I think people are really like, you know, want this information. Um, so essentially, we were just, you know, as part of our surveillance and QA, um, looking at, you know, myocarditis after boosters. Um, and it, you know, in included an IRB for this project as well. And so essentially looked at all of our 18 to 39 year olds who received a booster dose at least five months after their primary series and said, you know, who got myocarditis? Because if you look at what's reported in the VAERS data, um, it's, they're saying it's very, very rare. So they reported, uh, sorry, 54 cases for 26 million doses given. Yes, I remember this. This is presented uh, at the HIP. Yeah. So a very low uh, point, a risk of 0.21 per 100K. Um, and again, we're seeing, we saw six cases in our cohort of um, 65,785 patients. So we saw six cases and 65,000. Roughly um, 10K. Yeah. So nine per 100K. So I guess, you know, it presents the same, like what we've seen, it, it's the same presentation. Somebody comes in with chest pain, troponin bump, may have, you know, echo changes, may not. It's interesting how medicines progressed initially, all these patients were getting like cardiac MRIs. Mm -hmm. Nobody's getting cardiac MRIs anymore. Mm. It's, it's interesting how like, and, and I have no opinion on this, just, you know, observation as you watch this, but um just, I, I guess the point of this paper is um, that it's happening and we need to keep an eye on it and understand the risk of, you know, myocarditis after booster dose, because, you know, I think everyone's assuming that it's going to be less because of the time interval. Yes. And that makes physiologic plausible sense, but we can't just assume that we have to look at the data. That's such an interesting point. And so I guess I was... Um more surprised to read this than I was the first, because um, I think what it suggests is that, you know, to some degree, this phenomenon is due to stacking doses in a tight time window. And then the other thing I think people forget is that 21 and 28 days, they were not picked for optimal immunologic property reasons. They were picked because when you're in a crisis situation and you're running a randomized controlled trial, you need a readout quick and you're going to stack the doses as hot, as close together as feasibly possible so you can get your efficacy signal so you can approve this product and save millions of lives. I mean, I think, so I don't fault them for the, that time window. I think it right. was a very logical trial choice. Um, uh, and and then I think there's data that was showing that the people who happen to delay happen to have lower rates, and that gives you some information. And so I think 
And then the third piece is that with a lot of idiosyncratic drug or vaccine induced side effects, there is a tiny portion of the population idiosyncratically susceptible. And in the first or second dose, you identify those people and the cohort that remains to get boosted, you know, that has excluded the people who are like myocarditis susceptible. Mm -hmm. But I think what your paper shows is several things. One, spreading the dose might matter, but even if you're getting dose three, eight months or 10 months later, there's still a non-zero risk of myocarditis, suggesting that it is all, not all related to the timing. The second thing is, even though you've already excluded people who had myocarditis on dose one or dose two, because presumably they're not keen and eager to get boosted, they're probably you know, self-selecting out, there is still a rate of myocarditis that's non-trivial, suggesting that it must be immunologically mediated or, or you know, some other mechanism where it, people are still susceptible even if they've cleared the first two hurdles. Um, and then the third thing is the actual rate, which is, you know, I think something that now is, Israel has put out, I think kind of similar to what your rate is in your data set. Yeah. Um, and so I think those are the very important points. Yeah, I mean, we had nine per 100K in age 12 to 39, all comers, and then 14 per 100K in men. And again, small sample size, small, like low precision, would love to replicate it at all the VSD sites. But I guess something we need to keep an eye on. And, um, you know, I, I think it's important as we have these discussions of additional boosters. Um, Let's talk about that. So I think I'll give you an easy one. Okay. 85 year old woman, high blood pressure, diabetes. How many doses does this person need? And they've, and they never had COVID. Uh, where, where are we at? So they need their primary series yeah. and they need their, their two boosters. Yes, yes I, I think. Would, yes, primary series and two boosters. I have to make sure I keep my terminology right. I'm, I'm with, I, I would say they need at least three, at least three. At um, least three. And, so, and probably the fourth is going to win. I mean, I, we, yeah. yeah, I mean, an 85 year old, I would give them that that fourth shot. Okay, That's I would do too. Sure. Okay, okay, yeah, I would talk, yeah, okay. Risk now, benefit. it's all about risk benefit. Yes, and, and the risks to them are very low and, you know, and the benefit is potentially good. Okay, 51-year-old healthy man, okay, 51-year-old healthy man, they got two doses of Moderna uh, on the schedule and, um, and got boosted and then had Omicron, fourth dose. So, and it's so interesting because, you know, as chief of ID, we get this question all the time. Um, from our primary care docs, like, what do I tell my patients? And it's like, we don't have data to inform you right now. Like yeah. we have some, you know, neutralizing antibody data out of Israel and their healthcare worker population. And we have some data out of Israel in 60 plus that has some confounding, but there is some data. Um, and so, you know, if you want me to give you a data driven answer, I don't have the data to inform. Um, okay. I can say if you give them their their booster, their neutralizing antibody will will go up. <laughs> That's uh, I totally agree uh, on that part. Yeah, no, I totally. But I agree. mean, okay. I I would say my recommendation to that patient, without any data to inform, is that they have probably have durable protection because they've had three doses and they have Omicron, and so I would say they have durable protection. And right now, without any data, I would not advise them to get a booster. Twenty two year old, two doses, and just had Omicron. Should they get the third dose? A 22-year-old man, 22-year-old man, rower on the, the collegiate crew team, two doses, uh, and had Omicron fully recovered, looking good. So again, no data to inform. Um, I mean, I guess there is some data about booster doses in young men that has some limitations. I would say with the Omicron, um, they at this point, with what we know, they have durable protection and risk benefit, in my opinion, this is in my opinion, I, I would probably say to hold off until we have more data. Yeah, so- What would you say? I, oh, I totally agree with you. Um, and, um, and, um, and, and that's why I had an ax to grind, which is that Princeton, Yale, and Stanford uh, do not acknowledge that in their policy. And actually Stanford is poised to deport PhD students who are on visas because they're not getting the booster, even if they've had Omicron. Um, and, and some of these schools have implemented, they've decided that after 30 days of Omicron, it's safe to give the booster. I, I mean, I have a problem with, how can I put it? I mean, I, I feel like as policymakers, we lose sight of the goal. The goal is we don't want people suffering from COVID-19 and we do want to encourage vaccination. 
And you got to see the, the risk gradient by age and you got to take all your energy and think about the old vulnerable people. My understanding is right now in America, there's 65 year olds and 14% have not been vaccinated. 65 and up, they haven't gotten even one dose of anything. And many of them don't have never had COVID. They are just sitting ducks for a, a subsequent viral surge. It's, it's a total unnecessary risk um, to take. And you know we're going to be potentially those pockets of people, they're going to have a Hong Kong situation on their hands, um, which is terrible. Uh, so that's where our mental energy should be. And so when I see Stanford's mental energy on a 22-year-old person, uh, I get irritated because I expect better from Stanford. I mean, there's full of smart people. Um, okay, last question. Or no, because that's fun. Last question. Um, uh, a 12-year-old who got one dose and then before they could get dose two, 12-year-old boy had Delta. What should they do? Gosh. I don't know. I don't, I mean, I'd probably a 12 year old who had Delta. So they probably had Delta back in October, maybe. Yeah. So I don't know the durability of their protection from their Delta. Um, you know, the standard recommendation would be to vaccinate them. Um, I, I would probably vaccinate them. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. If it but, were my kid, like if it were my, both of my kiddos had two doses and then they got Omicron and, you know, they're looking at their doses and five to 11 year olds. And I'm like, I need to see the data before I can be certain. So yeah. I just, you know, I think vaccines, I think these vaccines are fantastic. I am a huge proponent of vaccines. I just want to vaccinate correctly and with informed data and no you know, exactly the, the, the risks and benefits and, um, you know, I, and just as much information as we can have. So um, I, I agree with you so much. And I think your answer is, is right. I mean, that 12 year old boy who had one dose and then had Delta and who's healthy 12 year old, otherwise no medical problems. I, I don't know. I don't, I, I can't look that person and the parent in the eye and say like, I know for sure I'm 100% confident they're going to benefit from that additional. You know, I just don't know the answer. Yeah. Um, and the reason it, but the reason I picked that case and troubles me is that Los Angeles school district was flirting with the proposal and they actually had it. It was about to happen where if that 12 year old boy didn't get dose two, that 12 year old boy is going to be thrown out of their school district and have to get remote school. And uh, California currently has a bill pending that if any kid over the age of five doesn't get vaccinated by January, 2023, they're going to get thrown out of school. And my, in my mind, that troubles me because these, because as you've acknowledged, um, there are things we know and there are things we don't know. And when you're in a situation like that, I want to go to a doctor like you and have a very sort of nuanced conversation and to ask you what you think and get your opinion, you know, and, and, and kind of see how you feel about it and then see how I feel about, you know, and have that kind of shared decision-making. And I think it is premature for the policymakers to legislate in this space. And, and I think that they they're, they obviously have a good intention. They want people not to suffer from COVID-19, but I think they don't realize that medicine does have clear-cut cases. That 85-year-old, you know, we're sold on. Yes, get all those shots. But medicine also has ambiguities and uncertainties. And sometimes you're not bringing your best thinking hat to medicine, I think. And I can understand in the middle of a pandemic that's been so disruptive, um, it's, it's, people are not always thinking very clearly and, um, and, and to think clearly, you need very accurate data and that's the work you've done. And you also, I think, need to have some emotional distance to try to think through it logically. Um, and so I think I agree with every one of your answers. I think they're quite right. And I guess I would say like, you know, I do not envy the policymakers because, you know, what we've been doing in this pandemic is essentially operating with incomplete information to make the best decisions we can to protect the most number of people. And I think really that's what they've been trying to do is to you know, use the available information um, to protect the most number of people. And at times information is in incomplete. And that's, I mean, that's medicine. You know that as an oncologist, I know that as an infectious disease physician, like you have information, you have to make the best decision you can. Um, and I think, you know, as, as we move forward in this pandemic, it's really just evolving information. And as we learn more and understand more, being able to adapt to that new information, to be dynamic, you know, to make the best decisions we can um, 
for that patient and for those policies. And so that's really what I would encourage is just to continue to be open to new information um, and, and make you know, the best decisions we can as we've been trying to do this whole pandemic. Yeah, that's really well put. And I guess I think anybody who practices clinical medicine knows you're gonna make decisions under uncertainty. And um, people who think that you can follow some cookbook for medicine have not uh, done enough of it because very rarely the cookbook applies to the person in front of you. Um, and I think the same is true with vaccines. My own personal story about how I got interested was, um, I think it was February, end of February or early March, 2021, where somebody forwarded me an article from the Jerusalem Post. And the Post article was, Israeli military recruits 16 to 19 men had a rate roughly one in 5K or something like that. And the moment I saw that, I think I instantly sensed that um, Israel, uh, they, they're, they're, they're probably not going to be wrong here. I mean, they're, they're probably very wise. Obviously, they were one of the first countries you know, I, my understanding is that the whole country is a Pfizer clinical trial site because that's apparently how we're approving all our products, just whatever we did them them last week. That's our approval. But yeah, so they were the first to get Pfizer vaccination, and they have a lot of smart scientists there. The moment they saw it, I thought it was credible. Uh, I tracked it in May when the EMA opened an inquiry. Um, I have slightly different views about the policymakers in this country, but um, I, I think that they did, uh, you know, uh, start to look into it by the summer of 2021. And then there was that famous um, HIP Verback meetings um, where we did get some estimates and we had some modeling. And then um, they had their model, and I, I published a model with uh, Wes Pegden's mathematician um, on this issue. And I think uh, I, the reason I was interested was exactly as you say, that the precise number would have some impact on some of these calculations of risk benefit and timing and dose and things like that. Um, and then when I saw your estimate, when I saw your paper, um, and I read your paper, obviously it's very elegantly presented. There's, I don't think there's anyone who can read your paper as a scientist and say you got it wrong because you got it right, because you recapitulate what they did and then show how you can add a few cases this way. Um, and so I think it's methodologically extremely strong and actually parsimonious because it's what it's the bridge between US data and, and I think number of other countries, as you say, Hong Kong, Norway, um, uh, Ontario province and Israel, it's the bridge. It's what actually makes everything tell a story which is that human beings have this thing happen and this is the rate. Um, and so that's why I think it's so important as we go down this booster discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, well, I guess I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, uh, any other thoughts on this issue? I mean, I guess, um, uh, any thoughts on uh, that we didn't talk about that you want to highlight? Um, you know, I guess I would just say to, to encourage like continued conversation about the science and the data um, and, and try and keep it really focused on the science and data because it can be really polarizing. Um, but if we really focus on, you know, what the data shows, I think we can, you know, truly hopefully improve vaccine confidence and vaccine safety. Um, because I think it's really important that we, you know, improve public confidence and vaccine safety because I am a huge proponent of vaccines. I mean, I oversee mm -hmm. vaccine safety and um, childhood vaccines are, are life-changing. And so I just wanna improve that. Um, you know, that, that conversation and that transparency so that people feel confident about uh, vaccines. And that's really important. I've read that a number of countries are reporting uh, lower than expected routine childhood immunization, including for things like polio. Um, I was just reading that Israel has had some cases of polio, which is unthinkable in this uh -huh. century. I saw that the Georgia, I think it was Georgia, they want to pass a bill that like removes uh, uh, all requirements for like even the regular MMR back. I was like, no, this is not the solution. The solution is the one new thing that has the one safety signal to have nuance there and like continue all the good stuff we've been doing right. for many years. That's the answer. Childhood vaccines are safe. They yes. are life-saving. They are yeah. so important. And we need to have confidence and continue to vaccinate our children um, because the alternative, like, People don't see measles, but measles, like you don't want, like Correct. the alternative is terrible. And yeah. it, it's because we haven't seen it that we don't understand the implications of the alternative. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate the work you've done. People should check out the papers. The second one is out already. It's the American Journal of Cardiology, Myopericarditis After COVID-19 Booster Dose Vaccination. It's article in press. The first one is on the preprint server. Uh, I know it's coming soon. Uh, uh, Katie Scharf, thanks so much for doing this. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Nice to see you. Nice to see you.